Thank you for joining the Ask the Expert session about executive function for adults with spina bifida. My name is Judy Thibodeau and I am SBA's National Director of Research and Services. I want to mention a few things before we get started. Now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Lisa Stanford. Dr. Stanford is a neuropsychologist with the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Adult Spina Bifida Clinic, and professor at the UPMC Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Dr. Stanford. Now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Lisa Stanford. Dr. Stanford is a neuropsychologist with the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, UPMC, Adult Spina Bifida Clinic, and professor at the UPMC Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Dr. Stanford. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for letting me come back. And for those of you who uh, sat through the torture that I gave you the last time. I really appreciate it. And we have questions that are still left over from that. Um, so I thought that I would start there and kind of answer those questions. And then the new questions that were submitted with registration and then any new questions that come up after that, I'm happy to answer as many as I can. Um, I did feel like that we sort of got cut off a little bit uh, with the last question from last week uh, about social media and, 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 playing online video games and all of those things. And someone asked if that contributed to executive functions and we were running out of time. So I said, yes. And I think that that's something that we could revisit. But when we think about executive function, our brains really, all of us, regardless of how our brains develop, have limited resources for attention. And so if we are constantly uh, on social media or playing video games or those things, we're constantly stimulating our brain to attend to certain things and that leaves us little or less room to attend to other things and our brain sort of gets used to that constant stimulation so i think that it does contribute in a way both in terms of our social isolation sometimes and also our um, um, sense of loneliness because it's not a way of connecting but also the fact that our executive function begins to become fatigued and we might already have executive dysfunction that can be made worse by some of the habits that we choose to engage. So I hope that that answers the question a little bit more thoroughly than before. Uh, one of the questions is, what do you think pediatric clinics should say to parents about executive functioning? Should they automatically evaluate children for executive functioning? So I think that there are many things that should be said to parents of children in a spina bifida clinic, and one of which is talking about what the brain looks like over time and what to expect in the future. And executive functioning or dysfunction is one of those things. I like to, having been a lifespan person and being in the pediatric spina bifida clinic, I like to begin talking about transition at age 12 transition to adult care, transition to life as an adult, transition to independence. So I really wish that pediatric clinics across the country would talk about transition earlier and would talk to parents about what it means to let go as our children age and may not need us in the same way. But I think that that's very difficult for parents, especially for parents who have uh, children with a disability. It becomes part of their identity. And I think it's very hard sometimes to let go. Um, so I like to talk about all of those things and executive function is one of those things. What I said in the last week or the last time we met, you know, executive functioning doesn't really fully come online until age 12. Our frontal lobes start to develop then more fully and become more sophisticated and they continue to develop and grow into the mid to late 20s, uh, sometimes early 30s. So that's not unique to spina bifida. That is common to all of us as human beings that we are not, all, we don't come out of the womb with all the executive function we need that tends to develop a little bit later on. So the good news is our brain continues to mature and develop and executive function skills mature and develop as our brain matures and develops. But the bad news is that co-occurringly we're confronted with increasing demands that make it even more difficult to utilize those executive functions that we need. So on one hand, you have a continuing developing brain. On the other hand, you have continuing demands that make it even harder. So it really sometimes can be about catching up and behind the curve. And once you sort of get there, everyone else has kind of moved on. And that is not unique to spina bifida, but it tends to be something that is very prevalent. And I would say that all of us have executive dysfunction, whether we have spina bifida or not. 
Um, all people with spina bifida probably have executive dysfunction to some point. All people, all humans with or without spina bifida have executive dysfunction to some degree. And it's how we develop those compensation strategies, whether or not it interferes to the point. So back to the question of, I think that we should be talking about executive function to children and what that means and also how to better prepare for that because that is the number one thing that seems to be getting in the way of people achieving their independence and adulthood are those tasks that really require planning and organizing and and showing up to work and 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 time management skills and organizing and doing two things at once. So those tend to get in the way the most, and they're probably going to be a prevalent concern throughout the lifespan of someone with spina bifida. Um, one question was, my son has amazing memory for facts, but not for day-to-day -day living issues like, did I pay my credit card bill? Any suggestions? Well, uh, I don't know about you, but I've forgotten to pay my credit card bill uh, maybe once or twice, but uh, that's what automatic uh, setting up. So I think the suggestions are to make those things as automatic as possible, to have online bill pay, setting up those things would be very beneficial. Um, but the amazing memory for facts, those are rote memory. And, uh, you know, I, oh, my poor husband, I'm going to reference him. He has an amazing memory for useless baseball facts. I don't even know why he has that, but he has an incredible memory for that, but can't remember something that I just told him the moment before. And so I think that we all have that experience of things that are interesting to us and relevant. We tend to be able to memorize and that becomes something that we've rehearsed because it excites us and we enjoy it. And then those things that are not so important to us that don't stay in our mind. So the example of forgetting to pay your credit card bill, that's more of a working memory task. You have to pay attention to something, rehearse it, store it, get it in there. And oftentimes those things that we need to do they confront us, we think about it, we go, oh yeah, I'll do that, and then whoosh, it's gone. And so we don't store that from memory, and that's why those things are so easy to forget. So as much as you can automize, automatize those kinds of things, have automatic bill pay, have a, a list written down so that you're able to check those things off and mark through so that you know what are the, what are the top five things that I want to make sure that I either as an adult with spina bifida or I as a child with spina bifida and with my parents, what are the main things that we really want uh, to make sure that those get done and have that sort of priority list. It's very difficult to make everything a priority, as you know, and that is an executive function task as well, really trying to be able to make everything a priority and determining what's relevant from irrelevant tends to be the most difficult part of executive function. Um, I'm not sure that I understand this question, so I may need clarification, but why is spina bifida being classified as developmental disability, intellectual disability? Um, so I guess I don't know where that is, but only the only way that someone with spina bifida should be classified as intellectual disability is if they have been given a standardized measure of intelligence that rates them between uh, uh, below 70, 75 and below in terms of intellectual functioning for uh, all of the scales, not just one scale versus another. So when I say one scale versus another, people with spina bifida tend to have very highly developed verbal abilities and do well on verbal parts of in intellectual measures, but those nonverbal and visual spatial aspects can be suppressed. And so putting those together and getting an IQ is not relevant and not meaningful for someone. So when I, I don't really talk about full scale IQ very much because I don't think it's as relevant, especially when you're gonna have a significant discrepancy between the verbal and nonverbal. But you should only be classified as intellectual disabled if you score 70 and below on that measure for all measures. And if you have been given an adaptive measure that tells that your day-to-day -day activities and and adaptive skills of daily living are also at that level. That is the only time in which someone should be labeled as intellectual disability, and it is not unique to spina bifida. This is in any case, in any person. Um, the developmental uh, disability is a broad umbrella term that says people that have developmental issues that have created a disabling condition, but it is not the same thing as intellectual disability. It is not an indication of your level of functioning. It just is a way of classifying for services and to say that someone has uh, developmentally, they had a disability that started at birth or early on in birth and has continued to interfere with their functioning as a non-disabled person in the world. I hope that answers your question. The next question was, how about if you're put on the spot, 
caught off guard and ask a question and you can't come up with an answer immediately, but it comes to, to you later. Is that executive function? Well, that's part of executive function. So that's also anxiety. Often we have anxiety and we know what we want to say and then we get in that situation and everything freezes, our brain freezes, and we can't find those words that we want to say. So it's an, a combination of anxiety and that executive dysfunction piece of not being able to pull out what we already have in our brain in the moment, but we can do it later. So some of the times I'll talk to <clears throat> adults with spina bifida about preparing a script, be thinking about what you want to make sure that you say to someone before you're in a situation so that you can make sure that you're a self-advocate and are able to say the things that you'd like to say in that moment. But it's all right too in that moment when someone catches you off guard to say, it's hard for me sometimes to come up with something in the moment. Could you give me just a little bit of time to think about it? And I use that for myself. I don't want to be impulsive. So in order to buy myself some time and not be impulsive, which is also an executive function, I might ask for time and say, I'd really like, I really appreciate what you just said to me. I'd like some time to think about that if that's all right. And so you create that buffer for yourself so that you can respond in a way that is authentic to you and that gives you agency, but also that allows you to uh, not feel that you're always not able to answer in that moment and then the anxiety freezes you. So buying yourself some time can be really important. The next question is, is a piece of executive function making it all about them? In other words, my son doesn't seem to take others' perspectives into consideration. So that's actually not necessarily an executive function. Of course, our frontal lobes tell us what to say when and how, but it's our right hemisphere, our non-dominant right hemisphere of the brain. So for those of you who attended the last session, I talked about that our left hemisphere develops first because we're a language society. All of our left hemispheres develop first in utero, in the womb, and the right hemisphere is a backup. And so when there is something congenital or something that occurs in the perinatal period or prior to that, then the right hemisphere takes a bigger hit. Part of the right hemisphere is that ability to recognize that someone else has a different perspective than our own and being able to take that and put ourselves into that person's shoes and think about, well, what would that person feel or what would that be like? That is a social skill. Now, executive function is a piece of that in that you want to be able to find what you've learned and pull it out and retrieve. But primarily, that is a right hemisphere function that has to do with facial recognition, that has to do with understanding that others have a different perspective than we than we do from our own. The next question was, do you have recommendations on how to develop compensatory skills if you do have executive dysfunction? And that is a very difficult question to answer because it's specific and unique to an individual. So if there are certain things that someone struggles, then that executive task would have its own set of recommendations. So that's a little bit broad for me to answer, but certainly compensatory skills are different than accommodations. It's very difficult to develop compensa compensatory skills when executive dysfunction is so prevalent. So I recommend more thinking about accommodations. What are ways to work around something and create an environment that allows you to function in a way that minimizes interference from your executive dysfunction rather than compensatory skills? Um, compensate, of course, means to compensate for something or to try to adjust to that, but accommodations are changing the environment around so that you're able to use those skills that you might have developed in order to compensate with executive dysfunction. The next question is, we noticed that our son with spina bifida will repeat new information out loud several times, and it seems like he's trying to file it away. It drives his older brother crazy. Is this part of executive function? Well, I would say the older brother probably has some executive dysfunction too, and that it drives them crazy. Depending upon how old they are, I'm not really sure. If they're a teenage boy, then I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. I haven't figured out that. But as far as repeating information. If you think back to when you're learning to speak as a child, how do people learn to speak? They repeat what they hear. They repeat it, they repeat it until they're able to engage in that conversation. So that is actually a learning strategy of repeating and it's also rehearsal. People with right hemisphere dysfunction, as I said earlier, when your right hemisphere doesn't tell you what you should be saying when, have a tendency to say everything out loud rather than internalize. And so it's both a maturity aspect of being able to internalize and say it inside your head and rehearse, which most of us do, as opposed to saying it outside. And so you're rehearsing it outside and it's a way to 
rehearse and store so that you can find it later. So it is a very good compensation strategy. And there's something to be said for pushing the buttons of your teenage brother, if that's the case. Um, let's see, can you give some specific examples of accommodations for executive dysfunction that a person can ask for in a workplace for a computer-based job? So the nice thing about um, having an evaluation and understanding your strengths and weaknesses, it allows us to tailor an accommodations plan for on the job. I always make it a part of, of our accommodations plan to say that someone needs bowel and bladder breaks and management. They need to have accommodations for if you miss work because of medical appointments. You, sometimes you need extra transportation time or navigation time. Those are important. But in addition to that, keeping a low uh, distraction work setting will be important if you wear noise cancellation headphones or if you could sit in a cubicle where you're not seeing so many visual and auditory incoming. Because again, that's the same thing I talked about with you know, playing games and those things. Our brain only has so many attentional resources and it makes it very difficult to attend to something you need to do when there's other things that are going on around you. So we, despite the fact that we think we do, we are not good at multitasking. We are not good at listening to music and doing our homework as our teens try to tell us that they are. Um, we just aren't and our brain just isn't made to do that. So thinking about keeping your brain, having as low stimulus as possible, keeping a routine, breaking down tasks and single components as much as possible, doing one thing at a time, keeping a list of what you've accomplished and crossing through it. There's nothing more rewarding than crossing through a list of things that you've been able to accomplish. And you can see that physical reward of having done what you needed to do. But many of the accommodations would be based on how someone did on a neuropsychological point, uh, evaluation. So another accommodation might be extended time on tasks or needing time and a half or needing more days to get something done than would be typical of non-disabled peers. <clears throat> the last question that was uh, left over, I'm, I was in a body cast or braces for six weeks until three years of age. Therefore, I was unable to crawl before I started walking. My eye-hand coordination is awful. Is this part of executive function for my spina bifida? Well, it's complicated, more complicated than that. So there are research studies that say if you don't learn to crawl, there are some motor milestones that are missed, and that can have an impact on later fine motor functioning and drawing and writing. But also fine motor difficulties can be very common in any kind of congenital disorder, especially if you are not a uh, dominant left-handed. Because remember, the right hemisphere takes a bigger hit, and in the front part of the right hemisphere is the motor strip that controls the opposite or contralateral side of the body. So if you have some disruption to that motor strip area and you're left-handed, that may mean that it's difficult for you to use that left hand. But you also can have executive dysfunction of organizing your thoughts and then getting it down onto paper, and that can make eye-hand coordination and getting thoughts onto paper and writing, catching and throwing, those things can be difficult as well. Because if you think about it, you have to cross over your body. And if one hemisphere is not as functioning and not as well developed as the other, it may be a mismatch and being able to translate motor function across the body can be difficult. Okay, those were the leftover questions. Do we want to address the ones that came up while I was answering those? Yes. Um, my friends have terrible startle reflexes. What part of the brain is that and why is it so sensitive? Ah, that's the limbic system, the amygdala. That's our emotion center brain, and that can be anxiety. It doesn't necessarily mean it's spina bifida, but sometimes people with congenital disorders have immature sensory systems, and they are much more sensitive. Smells, mm. taste, touch, all of those things can be magnified in someone who has congenital disorders. So it could be that there's anxiety that runs in the family, and then there's a lower threshold for sensorium. That, that's the incoming of what we hear and see and smell, and a startle response can be exaggerated. Does having a shunt affect how our brains develop? Yes. So in it, it not having a shunt also affects how your brain develops. So <laughs> if you don't have a shunt and you need one, that is not good for the brain. And so a shunt is vital to um, drain the excess cerebral spinal fluid that is built up in the brain to allow the brain to develop in the way that it needs to. 
um, the actual shunt placement itself. We have gotten better at minimizing the interference from surrounding tissue. But obviously, shunts are a risk factor. If they become infected, if they um, malfunction and you have to have another surgery and more anesthesia, they are mo it's a much more complex than just having a shunt being the issue. But not having a shunt when you need one is critical to the brain development and survival. All right, pretend you don't have access to a neuropsychologist. What's the next best person for this assessment? It depends on the person's age. So uh, for school age children, the school would be the next best. It's not going to be ideal, but at least you're going to be looking at some of the learning issues. There's not a good option for adults. Um, and that's why uh, I'm one of the few that was at the Congress when we were in Tucson. I realized that I was some kind of enigma, that I was the only one that was an adult neuropsychologist embedded in an adult neuropsychology program. So my field has a lot of work to do to help people understand that people grow up now and we survive and we have issues that confront us as adults and we need neuropsychologists to do that. Um, so it's really very difficult to assess how someone's executive function is doing and what skills you need without an evaluation. There are neuropsychologists across the country. Um, they're not necessarily spina bifida specialists, but they don't have to be in order to assess someone's brain function to help them. So you should have an available neuropsychologist nearby in some way. And most insurance coverages do cover a neuropsychological evaluation. Um, I don't know what a next best thing would be as an adult, it, unless you, um, through a college, if someone's in college, they could have testing through their disability resource center there, or if they could see a psychologist who could have help with some looking at some executive function and some other skill sets. Thanks. Is having trouble initiating a task executive function? Yes. So the frontal lobe tells us what to do when and how best to do it. And it goes back to the other parts of our brain to say, oh, what do I need to accomplish this task? Okay, so I bring that forward. So yes, it is not about being lazy. It is not about being stupid. It is none of those things. It is really that our frontal lobes aren't telling us to initiate a task and to move through something. So often we need reminders and some external force that helps us move and initiate a task. And that might just be as simple as a reminder. And that drives us crazy as parents to have to remind our adult children and, and our other children to do something that we think would be just so automatic. But for, for those who have challenges with executive function, task initiation is very, very difficult and needs external uh, reminders and prompts. What advice do you have for someone who had accommodations in school, but has struggled in the workplace? So you should have accommodations in the workplace, and that can be done by getting an updated evaluation and get those accommodations translated into the workforce. Um, you are protected under the American with Disabilities Act. It is a discriminatory function to fire you or uh, somehow retaliate for any disability that you have on the job. That is your legal right to have accommodations on the job. And there are often disability examiners or other adult people that do capacity evaluations or disability evaluations to determine how best to give you those functions on the job and those accommodations on the job so that you can be successful in the same way that that plan likely did for you in school. The more paper trail that you have from your early education, the more likelihood that you will get accommodations at the college level and at the work setting. That does not mean, I don't mean to say though, that if you haven't gotten it in the past that you won't get it as an adult, you can. And that is your legal right to have those accommodations on the job and not be fired or discriminated against for your disability. Do you consult with the Gatehouse, a residential vocational program in Wexford? Um, I know of it, and we see patients come from there to see us in the adult spina bifida clinic. So if you are a resident there and you come into our clinic, we, uh, yes, we work very closely with Gatehouse. I don't consult on site, though. How do we notify our employer that executive dysfunction is a possibility that affects our work? Are there any neuropsych, um, couple questions, are there any neuropsychology experts in Canada that you may be aware of? Um, I don't know if there are adult a neuropsychologist that do spina bifida. I do know that there are colleagues in Canada that are pediatric, but there's just not that many people who are with adults. Now I forgot the first part. There's an executive function for you right there. I just how forgot the first part. Our, how do you notify our employer that executive uh, dysfunction is a possibility that affects yeah. our work? 
Yeah, so it's very difficult as a person to advocate for yourself once you've already got the job and you haven't brought that up beforehand. It's really better to do it prior to the job and start off the bat with saying that I need ADA accommodations and that I have legal rights to do so and to have that. And then you have an evaluation and that plan is written up formally. But you also can get an expert. Some Like for me, I don't see everyone for an evaluation and I can write up an academic uh, I mean, an ADA plan for someone on the job, knowing what I know about spina bifida and what someone tells me is very difficult for them. And then we work with that employer uh, to put that plan into place. But it's often very difficult to self-advocate, if, especially if you didn't start at the very beginning. So a related question, my son is a teen and interested in looking for a job. Do they notify the employer of his disability during an interview or after they are hired? Um, so that's a really tricky question. I think that it's important on the initial interview to talk about the job. And if they call you back for a second one, I think that <clears throat> it, it's not um, it's not being deceitful to not disclose your disability. That's your right to, dis- to, to disclose that or to not disclose that. That is not, you don't have to. Um, and what you can do once you get the job and say, thank you for the job. And now I just wanted to let you know that I need accommodations and here's my accommodations plan. Um, so I think that that's probably a better way to protect yourself than doing so right off the bat. Because I think that people, we all know this, people discriminate against those with disabilities and those without disabilities. And I would, I would uh, opt for uh, less is more at the beginning and then getting those things into place for you. I think that's the last current question uh, if we go on to the questions that have been submitted. Okay. Let's see. My son has amazing memory for facts, but often can't remember. We talked about that one. How can this be improved? So they've had uh, psychoed assessments, but never gotten advice on how this can be improved. So you can't really improve Um, those day-to-day things, again, you have to really set up some accommodations and compensatory strategies to build in reminders, break things down into single components. Um, Having rote memory is a totally different thing than um, having the ability to remember the things that you need to do during the day. It's not about memory, it's about attention. And so you haven't held it long enough to store it. So having that, everything written down and going through a checklist is the best way to get them to do the things that you want them to do during the day. Um, Does executive function improve over time with advancing age? To a certain extent. So as I said earlier, our brain, our frontal lobes continue to mature and develop until the age 30. And then uh, our brain stops uh, developing in that way. We don't, I I mean, I've teased people and said our brain starts to die at at 30. It's not that it starts to die, but it doesn't have the rapid differentiation that it has up until that point. So executive function can improve, but remember the demands keep getting harder. So just when you've caught up, you're already behind the curve and you have to still continue to develop those strategies. Um, How can I begin to help my child at school age and help educate elementary schools to understand what to look for? So the school psychologist at the school should be your partner in that so that the school psychologist has evaluated your child and then can make recommendations. And sometimes a neuropsychologist can be an evaluation can be used to complement what's already been done in the school so that you can get more information about those higher level things that a school psychologist don't assess in their Um, um, evaluations at schools, but you can use that to determine what the child's strengths and weaknesses are and then design the plan around that, that the school psychologist should work with you in tandem and with the other teachers and an IEP or a a section 504 accommodations plan, either of those two things. All right, the next one is how to explain or convince family members that as you age, sometimes your abilities change. Explain that as you get older, you could have less I can days. How do you deal with what with I you let's see, how do you deal with I used to could do that, but now I can't keep up and no one wants to listen, only judge and bully you. And unfortunately, that is the case. Um, we all change as we age. And there is not one person on this planet that's going to be able to do what they used to could do. Um, And for some reason, because you've always been a certain way, our parents and those around us tend to think that we're gonna stay the same. But just as in normal aging, spina bifida aging brings about its own complications and accelerates those issues sometimes that you may have more greater difficulty earlier on and you can't keep up. 
And so judging and bullying obviously is not an answer for anything. And, and I certainly appreciate that that's the experience that many of you might have. Um, but I think that being able to say, I'm not able to do that. And, and, and I appreciate that as we all age, we're not able all able to do the things that we used to could do. And this is difficult for me right now. Um, it would be really helpful for me if you could help me do so and so and ask for help, be an advocate to ask for help, or at the same time say, you know, I mean, you could come up with a snarky response, um, but I tend to like to educate people instead of sort of make them feel bad for what they've just said. So I might say, gosh, I really appreciate that that that's not hard for you. It's really hard for me. Maybe you could tell me a way that I could do this better. And then you've helped someone sort of, uh, you've given them a role in your own advocacy, but you've also gotten them off you by saying, oh, why can't you do this? And golly, you used to could do this. What's happened to you? I hope that answered your question. I don't have hydrocephalus, but have problems with driving directions or giving too many instructions at once. I always have been horrible at math. What could cause this to happen? I'm educated with a BSW, but sometimes just don't, it thinks just don't compute. So this is more a right hemisphere issue that I talked about earlier, directions, right, left confusion, awareness of body and space. So that's that right hemisphere and not being able to find your directions and driving directions. So getting ways that speaks to you while you drive can be very beneficial. That's a nice automatic electronic way of helping you get around. It needs to speak to you so that you're not looking. Don't be looking at ways while you're driving. Just let it talk to you or getting some automated other Siri app or Google Maps or something like that that will help you get around. Um, but that is an executive function task, but it's also more a right hemisphere issue that's interfering. Um, and you can be very smart and get a Bachelor of Science, a BS, or Bachelor of Social Work, et cetera. Um, but mathematics is also a right posterior function, that visual spatial aspects of mathematics. So that is also a right hemisphere issue. And math learning disability is one of the most common learning disability, along with sometimes pragmatic reading comprehension can be most affected by spina bifida, given that that right hemisphere involvement, you have all the world all the words in the world in your left hemisphere, but your right hemisphere doesn't tell you when to say it and, and how and how often to say it and when to stop saying it. Um, let's see, what- uh, Dr. Stanford, how yeah. about if I ask you a couple questions? Okay. Uh, if someone's about to start graduate school for mental health counseling, active listening is a major skill to perform the task. May executive function be a challenge, especially with memory? So I think that memory is not an executive function. So let's separate those things out again. Again, there's attention and working memory. Those are the executive functions. Attention means paying attention to something or two things at once or shifting from one thing to the other. Those are the attention types. Whereas working memory is the ability to hold something in your mind while you're doing something with it. That's not the same thing as memory. So if you're not able to pay attention while someone is talking to you, taking notes or recording sessions, getting permission to record them so that you can take notes later and being a genuine person and listening doesn't require executive function, right? We can all be a kind person. We can all be listening um, and listening to what someone says and then reflecting back what we just heard them say. That's what I think about when I think about active listening. This is an interesting one. Is it executive function that causes one to be terrified, paralyzed, to do certain really important things that you've done before, but have no trouble, the individual, trying new things? Um, I would say that that's more anxiety related than executive function. Um, and I think, you know, we all... So anxiety is inherited. So it's not necessarily a, a part of spina bifida, but people with spina bifida are at greater risk for anxiety than they are for any other comorbid condition. Um, but that sounds like an anxiety response that you sort of panic in the moment. Could you read that to me again, Judy, to make sure that I didn't miss the point? Is executive function to, is it executive function to be terrified, paralyzed to do things you've done before and they're important, but you have no trouble trying new things? Right. So, so that's that in that moment. Uh oh, failure. What if I fail? What if I can't do it? What I do? And when you're trying new things, you don't really know whether you're going to do it well or not. But if you've had the experience of not doing something well, then that can create an anxiety response the next time that you have to do it. And you recognize that in the past you didn't do that as well, even though you're open to new things. Thank you. Is having ADD common with those with spina bifida? And who would be the best person to go to for testing for ADD? 
Okay, so I'm going to educate a little bit here. There's no such thing as ADD. It's all called ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, and there's three types. Combined type, which is what we used to think about as, as ADHD proper, right? And then there's inattentive type, which is the old ADD, but we don't use that anymore. And then there's the um, ADHD predominantly inattentive type, hyperimpulsive type, and um, uh, combined type. So those are the three types. It's all called ADHD. We don't use ADD anymore. Um, now let's go back to the question. So a ADHD, as I said last week, and those of you who may not have heard that, ADHD is a disorder that's separate and distinct. And I tend to reserve a diagnosis of ADHD for people that have genetic ADHD and no other reason for those symptoms of inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and distractibility. So I would not diagnose someone with spina bifida and ADHD. I just don't think that does any good. I don't think that's helpful. I think it's misinformation. I think people get distracted by that and tend to focus on the ADHD instead of the true core of executive dysfunction that can be associated with many disorders, only one of which is spina bifida. And, and there are multiple ways to have symptoms of ADHD that have nothing to do with ADHD. So I tend to reserve a diagnosis of ADHD for someone who does not have any other reason for why they would have ADHD unless they inherited it. Um, and then instead, I would use executive dysfunction associated with spina bifida and be very clear about what the symptoms are and how to address those rather than labeling, sticking on another label. Thank you. And an observation and maybe your thoughts about this, we need to start teaching our children with spina bifida to advocate for their needs when they're young so that when they're adults, they will know how. So could you say that again? So teaching our children how to advocate for themselves and their needs when they're young mm -hmm. should impact how they're able to do that when they're adults. Well, you would think so, but the executive dysfunction piece kind of can get in the way. So just because you're able to do something at one age doesn't mean you're able to do it at every age for the rest of your life. Because remember, the demands keep getting harder. And so we can't expect uh, the other thing aspect of that is generalizability. Once you get something right in a situation, it doesn't necessarily generalize to every generalize to every situation after that, after that to where you would be able to accomplish that task in the same way. Okay. I'm going to ask you one more, then we'll go back to your list. Do lesions heal that are on the right hemisphere of the brain when you have communicating hydrocephalus? So lesions are, aren't necessarily what happens. I'm not really sure what you mean by lesion and unless you have lesions are tumors or displacement of cells. If you have hydrocephalus, the tissue can die and there can be necrosis, but those are not the same thing as lesions. Um, so I'm not really sure that I can answer that in the, in the way that's being asked. I don't think I understand. And the rest of the question was, I have problems with math, patterns, spatial recognition, needs, need a list to get my daily work completed, as well as some other things I've heard mentioned here. Right. And that's that right hemisphere issue, but it's not about a lesion. It's about those are things that are known to be difficult in people with right hemisphere issues and spina bifida in particular. And so developing those strategies and finding ways around that rather than trying to make them go away or think about them as something that's going to heal or change over time physiologically. Back to your list. Okay, thanks. I only have a few more. The okay. problem is when the ch questions come up in the chat, they come up in front of me. And so it's hard to sort of listen to you and then see the chat pop up. So sorry about that. That's okay. a working memory thing too that's hard for me. <laughs> see, we all have it. Um, okay, let's see. I think you asked about Wexford in any capacity um, that uh, patients that are in Wexford can come down to our spina bifida clinic down in uh, at UPMC at Mercy Hospital. Let's see, what delineates the difference between executive functioning and ADHD? I think I sort of asked that. I mean, answered that. I know they're not the same thing. I also know about overlapping symptoms. I'm asking what would make an assessor decide what, which to choose when looking for at assessment results. So ADHD, I don't think is very helpful. Um, I would look more at someone's strengths and weaknesses and focus on that in the context of spina bifida and executive functioning rather than um, go down the rabbit hole of ADHD and distract someone from the true issue. Let's see. Um, I'm curious as to the state of academic research on teasing apart the nature versus nurture aspect of executive dysfunction. 
helicopter parenting, this box is too small, frowny face. So that was one of the questions that came in. Uh, I agree, boxes are small. And that's an organizational piece right there, right? Being able to fit it in that little space. Um, I think what you're asking is, can we, do we learn executive dysfunction from our parents? And I would say that no, that is nature. We all have executive issues. Our frontal lobes don't come out fully formed. They take some time to form and, and then they will take time to develop and developing strategies so that they don't interfere as much with our life. Um, but there is an aspect of nurture to where certainly if a patient is, uh, if a parent is very anxious and they are hovering, that can create an anxiety response in someone. You can learn by watching. Of course, there's a combination, but executive dysfunction by itself is a nature issue, not a nurture issue. Okay, bear with me. There's only a few more. Um, I've been told that those who have spina bifida occulta should have no problems. However, I've heard other people with this that do have problems. Those with multiple injuries, spina bifida occulta is not being recognized. Can you address this issue? So I would say that um, how much involved someone is with spina bifida occulta depends on the person, depends on other comorbid things that are happening, and depends on the compensation strategies and the resources and support that person has gotten throughout their life. Let's see, suggestions on solving for severe memory problems. I would need to have a lot more information on that to be able to help with that. Again, memory is one thing versus attention, but you can have memory books. If you get lost in places, you can take pictures and create names underneath them. You can have a memory book to help you navigate and get around. Um, you can develop mnemonic strategies, or you can just have someone repeat everything for you and try to write everything down or record those things. What are techniques to help my adult child clean up after herself, put things away where they belong, et cetera? Well, if I had that answer, I would be a millionaire because, you know, it's not unique to spider bifida to get our kids to clean up their room. But I'll tell you what's been very helpful is because people with uh, uh, spider bifida are much more verbal. I find verbally getting a label gun and labeling where things go like sock drawer or this drawer or that and, and practicing and having a label, it does not help to say, go clean up your room. That is too much of an executive task and that requires way too much organization. Instead, what you would say is, I want you to go in and just put the socks away and here's the sock drawer. Okay, you put the socks away, great. Now next, let's fold the shirts and put them in the shirt drawer. You are going to have to be that frontal lobe because the executive dysfunction is so significant that it's very difficult to take a whole room and try to organize it. But if you can then teach those skills and break them down into single steps, you're gonna have much more success and using verbal labels can be key. Um, let's see, last one. Do you know of any programs or events for spina bifida in Southern California? And there is a, a website that uh, you can DCHS, I believe, uh, .ca.gov that will tell you a list of spina bifida. They're all the children's hospitals. They're mostly for children. I don't know of any, but I know that the team is going to reach out to you directly. Right. Okay, that's all the all questions right. that I have. All right, I have a few. Okay. Why am I able to read at a high level, but have to read things multiple times to get it to sink in? Right, because that's the left hemisphere. You're highly verbal. You see it. You can read. You have great skills. But incorporating it is a working memory task to get it to stay in your mind. So you just have to reread to reinforce. That's the natural way that we learn. It just seems to be harder for people that have working memory issues. One of the things that I've used in the past is have if you read a paragraph and then you write down the key sentences or the key ideas that you got from that paragraph and put that and write that down somewhere. And then you read the next paragraph and write that down over here. And that helps reinforce the learning. Thank you. Is there a correlation for someone with spina bifida to be diagnosed with hypertension and hyperthyroidism in early adulthood? Um, that would be a physician question. I wouldn't be able to answer that, but yes, we know that those high, uh, occur at a higher rate. And I don't know that I'll, I'll ask this question. Would this also be linked to anxiety and easy startle responses to stimuli? It can. It can. Absolutely. High blood pressure is definitely related to anxiety. People who have anxiety are more likely to have high blood pressure because they have a cortisol response and you have an adrenal response. You have all those chemicals that sort of set off when we have a flight or fight response. Do you consult with neuroradiology about spina bifida and symptoms versus actual diagnosis? So I'm not sure what that means. Could you elaborate if I consult with them 
I'm not sure what that means. I think it means do you, does neuroradiology help with an actual diagnosis versus symptoms? Ah, so neuroradiology can be very helpful to see if there's a shunt malfunction, to see if there's a change in lateral ventricles. And if you have too much fluid, it can also be helpful for looking for a syrinx in the spinal cord. It can also be helpful for looking at tethered cord. Many people with tethered cord don't even know they have tethered cord until that's until something happens and they have pain and then they go in for neuroradiology and they find they have tethered cord. So we work hand in hand with neuroradiologists, neurosurgeons, neurologists, urologists. All of those people are on our team as well. Uh, I'm not going to ask you this question, but I want to read it out loud. I live in Florida and I'm an adult with spina bifida would like to find a group. Please reach out to the Spina Bifida National Resource Center and we will help you with that for sure. There is a chapter in Florida and there's some other activities that we can share. All right. Does birth order make a difference in how a spina bifida patient thrives in the executive function issue? Well, gosh, that's a... That's a really hard question. Um, I think that, you know, older siblings, there are certain things about being the firstborn versus the middle child and the baby. I'm the baby and I definitely benefited from my sister getting in trouble. So I think that the birth <laughs> order can have many, many influences on how you're treated by your parents and what your role is in the family. But I think it's not specific to spina bifida. Is it safe to say that learning things visually rather than reading instructions would be dysfunction? Uh, no, it's just a different way that the brain learns something. And some people, like for example, for me, I'm all left hemisphere. I have no right hemisphere whatsoever. And so I am a big word person. I love to read. I learn that way. And I couldn't find my way out of a bag. So I think that we all have strengths and weaknesses, and it's not necessarily specific to any kind of pathology. It doesn't make it bad just because our brains are different. It doesn't make it a dysfunction just because our brains learn differently. All of our brains are different. I recently started using medical marijuana. Could that help or hinder executive dysfunction? I don't think I'm allowed to comment on that for, for licensure restrictions since I can't prescribe. Sorry. Okay. I'm sure it helps. <laughs> okay. I see no additional questions. Does anyone, am I missing something? A la last opportunity. Oh. Is it common for someone with spina bifida to develop scoliosis? I had to get metal rods into the back and it has yeah. changed a lot of my functioning and leg spasms. Yeah, so scoliosis does um, happen co-occurring with spina bifida, but I would encourage you if you have someone like Brad DeCiano or another physician that comes to talk about those specific physiologic things. Do you see the comments about employment resources? They are, they are here for others to see. And Jessica, will we include comments like that that are information bearing in our recording? Can we? Certainly. Okay. Yeah. So the, yeah. the several people have offered resources and they will be included in the, re in the recording or the Q&A document that's actually printed. Oh, got a new one. How can we with spina bifida assess ourselves for executive dysfunction? Well, part of executive dysfunction is knowing whether you have executive dysfunction or not. And I think that would be very difficult to assess yourself. Um, that's hard because part of executive functioning is meta functioning, right? Being aware of your own functioning and understanding it, your strengths and weaknesses. And that's very difficult for people with executive dysfunction. So it's hard to evaluate it in yourself. Do you recommend an app, an app software to assist with executive function compensation? Oh, gosh, there is one, and I'll, I don't have it in front of me, so I'll have to send it. We just used it with someone in particular, and they found it very useful. I will send that in to you all so you can pass that along. Okay. And someone has referenced a resource called JAN. Yes, it's Ask JAN suggests that we examine looking at a job accommodation network for how to bring disability accommodations into employment, individual searches instead of putting disability first in the job search. Any comment? I, I don't know anything about that. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for the comment, the person who put it in. Let's see what else we get. 
Okay. Do you know of any resources for me for others with spina bifida in California? That's a, a good question for our National Resource Center. And there are a lot of there are a lot of children's clinics, as Dr. Sanford said, and there are some and few uh, spina bifida resources, but we do have an active uh, chapter in Southern California that might be helpful for getting involved. Now, in terms of neuropsych resources for adults, I'm not aware of them, actually. Right. A last question? Along with apps, can you include good websites for dealing with executive function? Yes, I will. I'll send those as well. I've been gathering some materials since I spoke last. So. Thank you. I have very few executive function issues, but I'm not a great, great at keeping my room clean either. For me, it's the amount of energy it takes me to do heavy cleaning. It doesn't seem worthwhile to expend that energy when I'll need <laughs> when I will need to redo the process all over again. I totally get that. <laughs> I get it. Pick your battles. <laughs> it's a thankless job. Any, anything else? Well, Dr. Stanford, thank you for these two sessions. Sure. Um, all of you who are here and who have registered will receive a recording of both, of both sessions. I think you've already received one. And there will be a question and answer document that you'll receive and will include uh, resources that you have su suggested and that Dr. Stanford recommends for us as well. Yes. I have one last question. How can I better be better at being on time for work? <laughs> Set an alarm earlier? No. <laughs> you know, that's hard because I think uh, we don't know. Part of executive dysfunction is knowing the time it takes to get a task done. And we can, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm very good at expanding to fill the time that I have if I need to. But yeah, you may need to get up earlier and lay out your clothes the night before and do things that you can, as much as you can do the night before when you're not quite as, as sleepy and wanting to crawl back in the bed. Right. Okay, an issue for many, right? Um, Dr. Stanford is at the UPMC, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center in Pittsburgh. Someone that's, asked where you're located. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you for everyone right. for joining us and stay uh, tuned for uh, the information about the session. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Bye. You.